I know, it's probably a surprise to some of you. <laughs> but I'm passionate about my God. I love my God. I love Jesus Christ. He saved me from my sins. Why would I not be passionate about that? I'm passionate about my family. I've got a beautiful family. I've got a lovely wife who I've just celebrated 50 wonderful years with. God bless you for putting up with me. I'm not the easiest guy to get along with. I've got seven grandchildren. I've got three great-grandchildren. I mean, I'm just blessed. I'm passionate about my family. I'm passionate about my country. I love the United States of America. Amen. I spent 20 years in the Air Force serving my country. I love my country. I spent a year in Korea without my family. My family stayed out at Mather Air Force Base by themselves while I went to Korea for a year. When I got back and we landed at Travis Air Force Base, I got off that plane, I came down those stairs, I got down on the tarmac and I kissed the ground. I missed my country. I was glad to be back. I love that flag right there. I love the national anthem. I stand for the national anthem. Don't even get me started on that kneeling thing. Uh, don't even get me started. You're not supposed to be political in the pulpit, so enough said about that. Listen, I'm passionate about the Notre Dame fighting Irish. I'm from South Bend, Indiana. I love Notre Dame. Sorry, USC. You kind of got it handed to you last night. And anybody that's been around me for a while knows that I'm passionate about the Denver Broncos. I spent eight years in the Air Force in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I, I got to liken the Denver Broncos. I'm very passionate about them. And during the playoffs in 1987, I was challenged to put my money where my mouth was. The challenge was this. If the Broncos made it to Super Bowl XXII, I was challenged to swallow a goldfish in front of the entire church. <laughs> now, I'm thinking that's a pretty safe bet. I love my Broncos, but I had no confidence that they were going to get to the Super Bowl. Well, lo and behold, they ended up in the AFC Championship game against the Cleveland Browns. The Broncos got the ball on the two-yard line with five minutes to go, and they were down by seven points. Anybody here that's a... Uh, avid football fan, you've heard of The Drive. The Drive was when John Elway came in, the quarterback for the Broncos, and drove them 98 yards and threw a touchdown as time was running out, tied the game, and it went into overtime. The Broncos are lining up for the winning field goal in overtime for a trip to go to Super Bowl XXII. Now, if you can picture this, I'm on my hands and knees in front of my television, like this, with my head buried in the carpet, because I can't be bear to watch what's going to happen. The next thing I hear is, it's good. The field goal is good. The Broncos are going to the Super Bowl. And I'm up off my feet, and I'm running around the house, and I'm acting like a crazy man. I know the neighbors thought I'd lost my mind. Carol's looking at me like, how do you get so passionate about a football game? And then it hit me. <laughs> I got to swallow a goldfish. <laughs> what are you, stupid? What kind of a bet was that? I'll try to make this short. 
we called all the kids in from junior church, you know, all the things that was going on uh, at, during the adult church, and we brought them in, and we lined them up. They're on their knees in front of the, the platform here, and I take the uh, goldfish that's in this little cup. I didn't put it in a glass cup. I didn't want to see it, wanted to see how little the goldfish was. <laughs> I had somebody come up and verify that there really was a live goldfish in there, and they did. I gulped that thing down. I did not chew. <laughs> no. No. I gulped that goldfish. <laughs> so I walked to the front of the platform. The kids are down here, and I'm going, oh, 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 oh. I, it's right there. I can feel it. It's right. Th oh, wait a minute. No, it's over here. You should have seen them kids, man. They're I know there are some 30-somethings or 40-somethings out there today saying, I remember this crazy dude swallowing a goldfish in church. You might say, I'm a little bit passionate. You also might say, I'm a little bit crazy. I'll let you decide. But did you know that the creative force behind all great art all great drama, music, architecture, all great writing is passion. Nothing ever gets accomplished without passion. Nothing great is ever sustained in life without passion. Passion is what energizes life. Passion makes the impossible possible. Passion gives you a reason to get up in the morning and say, man, I'm going to have a... I'm going to do something with my life today. I'm going to have a great day. And without passion, your life becomes boring and dull. It's what mobilizes armies into action. It's what causes explorers to go boldly where no one's ever gone before. It's what causes a scientist to stay up all night trying to find the cure for a dreaded disease. Passion is what takes a good athlete and turns them into a great athlete. Folks, you've got to have some passion in your life. Hopefully you do this morning. You know, one day a man walked up to Jesus and he said, he asked him, he said, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Basically what he was saying, I want you to love me passionately. You see, nothing else matters in life if you don't love God passionately. He didn't want you to love him half-heartedly. He wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love the paraphrase of that verse in the Message Bible. It says, love the Lord your God with all your passion, with all your prayer, with all your intelligence, with all your energy. That word passion in the Greek is the word heart. And God's saying, I want you to put some muscle into it. I want you to have some energy and emotion in your relationship with me. Don't be a wimp or a nabby pamby about it. Give it all you got. In fact, that truth is all through the Bible. The Bible tells us that we're to seek God passionately. We're to love God passionately. We're to serve and obey God passionately. And we're to trust God passionately. And if you still haven't got the message, in Colossians 3, 23, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart or passion as working for the Lord and not for human masters. But here's the depressing thing. In America... It's okay to be passionate about anything except God. That's not politically correct. I can be passionate about movies. I can be passionate about sports, politics, fashions, clothes. I can be passionate about restaurants. And some of us are really passionate about restaurants. <laughs> but I can't be passionate about God because that's a no-no. 
Did you know if you go to Amazon.com and you type in the phrase, a passion for, you'll come up with a couple of hundred books with, the title, with that title in it. There are books called A Passion for Birds, A Passion for Books, A Passion for Cactus, A Passion for Chocolate, which is totally understandable, right? <laughs> I mean, who doesn't have a passion for chocolate? A passion for fishing, flying, gardening, golf, hunting, mushrooms, needlepoint, pasta, ponies, potatoes, roses, shoes. There's even a book called A Passion for Steam. For the life of me, I can't figure out who would get passionate about steam. But to each his own. I see it every day. I'm driving through Sun City. I see passion. Every day I see passion for softball. Golf, tennis, pickleball, exercising, dogs. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> Nothing wrong with passion, right? Hallelujah, they got passion. They're getting into what they're doing. God bless them. But here's the point. In our culture, it's okay to be passionate about anything except your faith, or your relationship in God. I can go to a rock concert, a political rally, a baseball game. I can shout my head off. I can get hoarse from yelling. When my team loses, I can cry. When my team wins, I can jump up and down and dance around and wave my hands in the air. And if I do that at a game... People will point and they'll say, now there's a real fan. That guy's passionate about his team. But listen, listen, let me raise my hand in church. Let me say amen in church. Let me show any passion in church. Let me do anything that would express how much I love the Lord, and people will point and whisper all right, but what they'll say is, that guy's a fanatic. He's a nutcase. A weirdo. You certainly want to, don't want to get too emotional about your faith. It's okay about anything else, but not about that. But I want to show you something. I want to show you what Romans 12, 11 says. Never. Be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. God bless you. Did you, did you ca never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor? You have to keep the fires going in your life, folks. Did you notice the word keep? So it's not automatic. It's a choice. It's a discipline. It's something that you have to maintain in your life. You're not by nature passionate about God. Sometimes at birthday parties, people will buy helium balloons and use them for decorations. And as you know, if they get loose, they'll go up to the ceiling and they'll stay up there. But did you notice that they don't stay up there forever? In just a few hours, they begin to dissipate. They begin to lose their steam, and they float back down. Well, we're like that sometimes, aren't we? When you first become a believer and you really understand what a good deal you've gotten, man, you're excited about it. Yeah. Woo, my sins are forgiven. I have a purpose for living. I have a future home in heaven. Wow, I have passion. But as time goes by, you begin to lose a little steam, maybe. Why does that happen? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. As we go through God's word today, we're going to look at six passion killers, if I have time to get them all. Things that can rob the joy out of your life. And the first is an unused talent. An unused talent will cause you to lose your passion for life and your passion for God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Each of you has been blessed 
with one of God's many wonderful gifts to be used in the service of others. So use your gifts well. You see, God gives you certain talents and gifts, and those gifts are ta and talents are not for your benefit. They're for the benefit of other people. My talents are for your benefit. Your talents are for my benefit. You're to use those gifts in the service of other people. And God has given you a special role in this world. He wants you to make a contribution with your life. Listen, if you need somebody to sing a song, preach a message, maybe even tell a joke now and then, I'm your guy. That's what I do. That's what God's gifted me and blessed me to do down here. But trust me, listen to me when I say this. Don't ever have me do anything mechanical, <laughs> anything electrical, and whatever you do, do not have me build something for you. <laughs> if you know what's good for you, you're going to call Tom Kingsbury or Ray Holly or Jim Bartol or any number of people sitting in this room that are gifted and talented in that area. I'm not him. And the rest of you here this morning have gifts and talents that you're passionate about. Jim Brown on the organ, that guy has passion when he's playing that thing. I'm surprised it don't bounce across the room. <laughs> or he bounces, one of the two, I don't know. But let me warn you. If you don't use your gifts and talents for the benefits of others, you're likely to lose your passion. I don't want that to happen to you. The second cause for a loss of passion in our lives is an unconfessed sin. Folks, this is a big one. Very few things will rob us of joy, our confidence, our passion more quickly than guilt. You can't feel enthusiasm and guilt at the same time. You can't feel guilt and passion at the same time because guilt, by its very definition, will rob you of your passion. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 38, 4 and 6. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and I am brought low. You ever had your computer crash? <laughs> I know you have. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And guilt does that to us as human beings. God didn't make us to carry around guilt in our life. He made us to deal with it immediately. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross to say, I want to offer you freedom from guilt. That's God's gift to all of us. But some of you this morning are in the midst of a personal system crash. The joy in your life has crashed, and you're trying to keep up the enthusiasm. You're trying to keep the passion alive, but the guilt keeps crashing your system. So what do you do? Fortunately, this is a problem that can be remedied very quickly. You can do something about it right now, right this minute, because Jesus has already done everything that's needed to be done to deal with our guilt. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, that's my place there. I would encourage you to do it right now, right this minute. Don't wait. Right now, in your heart, take it to God and say, I confess it. God, would you relieve me of this guilt? Thank you for forgiving me. Would you please restore my passion? There's a third cause for a loss of passion in your life. It's an unresolved conflict. We get dry up here. Listen, conflict will drain the passion right out of you. Have you ever started your day 
You just know it's going to be a great day. You fly out of bed, man. You're wide awake. You're showered. You've had your breakfast. You're ready to roll. But then you're on your way out the door, and you have a fight with your husband or your wife. All the zip goes right out of your doodah. <laughs> it's like the air going out of a tire when conflict comes. It takes all the passion out of our lives. Your attitude all of a sudden just goes flat. I'm going to tell you something this morning, and please don't tell anybody else about this, all right? There are people I don't like being around. I can't wait for the next time to miss them. <laughs> Why? Because there's a conflict waiting to happen. There's conflict all around them. It seems like they're always into it with someone. My younger sister used to go to the same church that I went to years ago. Uh, she was probably in her 20s. And she was always into it with somebody. Sis, I, if you're going to watch this video later, I love you. But uh, this is a great illustration, so I'm sorry. <laughs> she was always into it with somebody. Somebody in the choir, somebody in the church, somebody in our family. So she was always in a conflict with somebody. And finally, one day, she got into a conflict with my wife. Folks, let me tell you something. This is the sweetest, kindest, most caring, mercy-gifted person in the universe. If you have a conflict with her, you got a problem. She avoids conflict like the plague. And my sister is in a conflict with my wife. So I said, all right, that's enough. So I went to her. And I said, let me, let me get this straight. You're into it with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. You got all these conflicts going on in your life. Have you ever considered the thought that you might be the problem? The common denominator in all of these conflicts is you. You may be sitting here this morning. You may need to take a look at why you're always in some sort of a conflict. Have you ever considered the possibility that maybe you're the problem? Conflict is like a computer crash. It's not if. It's when that conflict is going to come. The question is, how are you going to handle it? What are you going to do about it? You can't control the other person. But you can certainly control the emotions that you're going to have in the midst of that conflict. There are three emotions that kill our passion in the midst of a conflict. Resentment, jealousy, and anger. And the Bible has some verses that talks about that. Both of a couple of them are in Job, Job chapter 5. Resentment destroys the fool, and jealousy kills the simple. And in Job 18, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. Resentment, jealousy, anger are all passion-killing emotions. You have to decide when it comes to those emotions what you're going to do with them. And you have to let them go. That's why forgiveness is so important. If you want the passion to be restored in your heart, you have to forgive. You have to let it go. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but I'll be letting them off the hook. Pastor, I want them to pay. I want them to pay dearly for hurting me and upsetting me. I'm not telling you to let them off the hook. I'm telling you to put them on God's hook. Who do you think is better at handling the situation of a conflict, you or God? I, know, I don't want to be on God's hook. I don't know about the rest of you. Just say, God, I can't handle this, but you can. I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to leave it to you. And if you don't, the resentment that you have for that person is controlling your passion. It's controlling your life. So you forgive and you let it go. That's how you resolve the conflict in your heart, and stop this passion killer. Now, let me just say this, and I'm going to move on. 
just because I forgive you doesn't necessarily mean I want to hang out with you. Because you're probably still a conflict waiting to happen, and I can't wait for the next opportunity to miss you. I've forgiven you, and I've turned you over to God, but until he deals with you and you fix your attitude, you're probably not going to be invited over for a barbecue. There's a fourth cause uh, for a loss of passion in your life, and that's an unsupported lifestyle. Some, sometimes you lose passion for God because you're not spending time around God's people who have a passion for God themselves. You're not spending time around other Christians. You're not getting any fellowship. I love this incredibly practical verse in Ecclesiastes. It says, two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And we fall sometimes, don't we? We stumble at times. We all need people to help us in our lives. Did you know in a prison, when they want to give somebody the ultimate punishment, where do they put them? Solitary confinement. They totally remove them from everyone else. Because we're made to be around other people. Whether you're married or single, you need relationships with others, and preferably others who are living life with a passion for God. I've seen a lot of people lose their passion for God, and there's a predictable pattern that usually takes place. The first thing that happens is they stop coming to church. And I'm not really talking about the ritual of, of you know, coming and sitting and being in the service. I'm talking about drawing back from relationships that they have with people in the church, being around other believers. And there's a lot of reasons that we tell ourselves that's okay. You know, it's summertime. I'll, I'll watch it on the Internet. I've got other things to do. I'll get back to it soon. But whatever the reason, you start not spending time around other people who have passion for God. The next thing that happens is your heart starts to turn cold. You start to feel far away from God. And what you really need is to be around other people who can warm up the love that you have for God in your life. But if you have no inspiring contact with other believers, your heart is going to grow cold. It's inevitable. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging one another. Folks, I beg you not to let your passion fail because you're cutting yourself off from others who have a passion for God. The fifth passion killer is an unclear purpose. You see, when you forget your purpose in life, that's a sure way to kill your passion for life and for God. If you don't know the purpose for life, why bother? Why get up in the morning? Why get out of bed? Life without purpose is activity without direction. It's motion without meaning. It's trivial and pointless. And it's easy to forget why we're here. We get distracted by all kinds of things. But whenever you forget why God put you on earth, you're going to drift towards apathy. And maybe you felt like Isaiah, who said in Isaiah 49, I've labored to no purpose, and I've spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Passion and purpose go together. When you have a, a clear purpose, it's going to give you a lot of passion. But it's got to be God's purposes for your life. That's what's going to give it significance and meaning. And the more you understand God's purposes for your life, the more passionate you're going to be. Thomas Hobbes, who was an English professor, scientist, historian, he wrote this about passion. He said, passion is waking up in the morning and bounding out of bed because you know there's something out there that you love to do, that you believe in, that God made you for, and you're good at, something that's bigger than you are, and you can hardly wait to get at it again. It's something that you'd rather be doing than anything else, and you wouldn't give it up for money because it means more to you than money. That's passion. 
So whenever your purpose gets unclear and you tend to forget why you're here in the first place, you're going to lose your passion. Lastly, the sixth passion killer is an undernourished spirit. Every day, we face all kinds of circumstances that conspire against us to kill our passion. Tomorrow morning, you're going to get up. You're going to have distractions and dis disappointments. You're going to have conflicts, challenges, changes, problems, pressures, frustrations, fears, failures, fatigue, and all of these things are going to fall in on you to kill your passion. So you must intentionally nourish your spirit. But how do I do that? Well, you're going to need times of worship with God every day where you get to know him and he gets to know you. I mean, he knows everything about you anyway, but you need fellowship with other believers. You need to read God's word and grow to be more like Christ. You need to have a ministry where you're using your talents to help other people. You need to have a mission in the world where you're sharing your faith. So how do I do that? How do I plug into God? How do I, how do I have this living, vital, daily relationship with God that keeps my spirit nourished? I think the starting point is first to remember how God feels about you. Did you know that God is hopelessly in love with you? Hopelessly in love with you. Maybe the reason you're not passionate about God is because you've forgotten how passionate God is about you. The Bible says you must worship only the Lord. Listen to this. For he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. Did you know that? Did you know that God is passionate about you? He's not saying, oh, yeah, just another one of my creations. Next. No, he's passionate about you. He made you to love you. You were created as an object of his love. But how do we know that God is passionate about us? Well, the proof is in the cross. Jesus stretched out his hands, and they nailed him to the cross. And he was, in essence, saying, I'd rather die then live without you. That's how passionate I am about my creation. I made you. I love you. The Bible says in Psalm 107, 43, whoever is wise will remember these things and will think about the deep love of the Lord. And as you think about God's love for you this morning, I want you to take a, just a minute and go through the checklist of passion killers and maybe renew your commitment to him. I don't know. if you're, You may be on fire for the Lord this morning. Your passion may be turned up all the way up. But then again, maybe some of these passion killers are in work today. Maybe you have an unused talent or an unconfessed sin Maybe it's an unresolved conflict with someone or an unsupported lifestyle, an unclear purpose, or an undernourished spirit. I'd like to read Psalm 107, 3 one more time. Whoever is wise will remember these things and will think about the deep love of the Lord. Folks, it's wise to remember the passion of Jesus Christ and why he died for us on the cross and how much he showed us his love for us. And here's what it says. God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You know what the worst sin is for Christians? It's not adultery. It's not murder. God tells us what it is in Revelation chapter 3. He says it's being lukewarm. You have no passion in your life. 
said, I'd rather have you hot or cold. Lukewarmness makes me sick to my stomach. You make me want to throw up. I'd rather have you hot or cold. C.S. Lewis said this, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. Moderately important. If Jesus is God and he loved you enough to come down here and die on the cross for you, you owe him the rest of your life, every spare minute of it. You owe him all the passion that you can muster. If he didn't do that, then get up out of your seat, go home, and live your self-centered life. Because the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. It either deserves your entire life or it deserves nothing. So, how's your passion for God? Are you lukewarm? Are you just going through the motions this morning? Or are you red hot for God because he loves you so much? Has there ever been a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are right now? If so, why? Nobody's holding you back. The truth is you're as close to God as you want to be. You can have as much of God as you want. You can be as passionate about God as you want. And if you're not, guess what? It's your fault not his. But here's the deal. You can only be passionate for God if you know him. And if you're here today and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, you need to acknowledge this morning that you're a sinner and you need to ask God for his forgiveness. Only then will you have passion for God. I pray that you will do that this morning before we leave here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the passionate love that you have for us. You couldn't have said it more clearly in your word. You couldn't have shown it more clearly than by sending Jesus to die on the cross. You love us more than we can imagine. Help us to learn to love you back. Forgive us for our lukewarm attitude toward you. And we pray that you would change our hearts this morning and reignite the passion in our lives. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please stand.